they go in order for a purpose. And so for people who've gone through it and for people who try to jump to other steps, they probably figure that out. So uh, one and two we did, which was for me, uh, basically the first step is reflecting on what it was like before you got sober and coming to the conclusion. The first step was is a reflection of our observations, which weren't really uh, hitting home because of the denial and of the effect of the disease. But we come to this conclusion that we were powerless over alcohol and our lives had become unmanageable uh, because it was freaking obvious, really. And then step two, and, and everyone has their own view of it. Step two to me is an observational step uh, based on what's happened to you after you got sober. So when I came into AA, I followed suggestions, I went to meetings, I got commitment, and I saw after about eight weeks, I hadn't drank or used. So I had come to believe through observation that something had done for me what I couldn't do for myself, that something had restored me to sanity concerning the insanity that precedes the second, uh, the first drink, the second drink also. The first. And uh, so, that's just the way I see it. And then step three, so obviously the progression would be once you see the condition that you're powerless and, and the dilemma is lack of power and we need to uh, look for power outside of ourselves because ourselves has been taken over by a disease that in, uh, seems to be more powerful at the time. So we're, because we're doing a lot of stuff against our will so something is overriding our decisions and our will to keep us to causing to keep doing the same old same old so step three is when we is a pivot point so we've we've had the effects of the first and second step and therefore we hit the third step and there's a there's a there's the proposition of turning one's will and life over to the care of a higher power that higher power can be whatever you understand it to be. A group of drunks, you know, the, uh, the great universal whatever truth. And so the, the trick for me was the idea of decision because basically, it, let's say if, if, my, if the life was under my control, I could have just turned it over to the care of a higher power. But I have to make a decision to turn it over because I really, are, I'm not in possession of my own life. I'm basically occupied. I like to see it as a parasite, a parasitical movement. And that parasitical movement has got the last hope, you know? So I make a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of a higher power. And immediately it is, it's, uh, the, the next response is action, which is the fourth through nine. So the fourth step. Because the four through nine, the action steps of the program is what allows which those activities, those processes diminish the influence of the parasite in us so that the higher power that in my view is always available at all times suddenly becomes available to us because we're now available to it. And that higher power is what keeps us sober in a sense. So four through nine, the first one, the fourth step is to take an inventory to look at uh, what's unsaleable. They give a lot of analogies. Or, but to me, I want to pinpoint the one way I see it, which is, all right, so I make the decision. And, you know, my idea of surrender in my head would be, you know, standing on a cliff with a wind machine blowing my hair with girlfriends and ex-girlfriends looking at me adoringly, and then I turned my will my life over. I didn't expect to have to be told to go home and write about stuff, but that's what happens. So I go to, I do an inventory, and if you never heard of Joe and Charlie, I recommend Joe and Charlie. I think their information is still available. I had uh, profound effects by going there. I'd like to share a little story. I remember I was in AA, I was only in for a few months, and I was at a meeting, and a meeting, uh, these two people shared, and they both looked sort of bright. And so I was interested in what they were talking about, and they were talking about this Joe and Charlie seminar. And then 
that meeting was over and I didn't hear about it for a few months. And then some secretary announced before a meeting, hey, we have applications for the Joe and Charlie seminar this year in Sacramento, California. I ran up there, grabbed the application and set my money in and I went. And I had done an inventory, but what happened with me, I didn't see like the first real wave of recovery, which I, I, I didn't see my role in things. That was the, that is one, that is one of the most important points of recovery is when finally it shifts and you see your role in things instead of having a laser beam on other people's role in things and other things. And so I went to that Joe and Charlie Saturday morning, they went over the fourth step and I sort of got it the way they presented it. And I ran back to my motel and I did an inventory and in about an hour and a half or two hours, and I saw my role in things. Great and that's where, something, that's where our light went off. So the way I like to present the inventory process now is based on page 64. On page 64, in the pa last paragraph on 64, or the third paragraph, the third paragraph, it's, so it's the third paragraph on page 64 of the big book. And Just keep going. All right, so the sentence starts with being convinced, which is starts with being convinced, and being convinced means to believe with certainty. Yeah. So when they present the case of alcoholism to us, one of the requirements is to believe with convince means to believe with certainty. And then it says to believe with certainty that self and my feeling of self is what I I that term is the parasitical movement. Um, this is just my take on it. So being convinced that self, the feeling of being the doer, the thinker, the haver, the loser, the one who's seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, touching, a certain ownership of living, yeah, of being the one. So being convinced that self manifested in various ways. So was what had defeated us. So it was so beautiful for me because I saw self as foreign and then I saw us as distinctly different. So there was a separation and I believe Bill W may have known it or not, but he makes it very clear here, being convinced that self manifested in various ways is what has defeated us. So it says if we're clear on that, it says we, we considered its common manifestations. And then the next paragraph oh, is resentment. Yeah. The next paragraph is resentment. So if you look at it from this view, resentment is a manif resentment is a manifestation of self in one's life. Yeah. Resentment is a manifestation of self in one's life. And we, a lot of us, keep speaking of resentments as if they're ours. Yeah. So this idea of identification with the manifestations of self, to me, is the bondage of self. Again, I'm going to share it again, because to me, this is a very important point or a pivot in, my pro in the program of AA for me. Being convinced, that means believing with certainty by my own observation and reflection, yeah, that self manifested in various ways is what has defeated us and we are going to consider its common manifestations resentment is the number one offender and then we go into fear and then we'll go into sex basically looking at how we hurt people in the pursuit of what we want but first i want to just stay on this point the manifestations of self, some of the common ones are resentment, fears, and harming other people in the pursuit of what we want. Those are common manifestations of self, but we're the us. We're distinctly different. And I believe, humbly, something has taken us over and is using us to manifest through. And when it does, we identify as it. I don't see how we're going to be free of it. I don't see how we're going to be free of resentments if we keep calling them ours. Yeah. So that's to me is the, the spirit of how I look at the 12th step of the fourth step is a review on 
the manifestations of how self defeated me okay. in my in this life. Yep. All right. So then, obviously, if you follow Joe and Charlie's methodology, they have four columns for the inventories, and you're going to do resentment, fear, and and looking at our sexual behavior. And we're going to the first column is either people, places, or things. So by so an example of resentment would be I have a girlfriend Wendy and Wendy leaves me that's why I resent her she leaves me and then the third column the way they view it is based on the agenda of the instinctual agenda that they he starts to mention on the bottom of page 64 of Bill W he calls it self-esteem personal relationships pocketbooks well Joe and Charlie breaks them down as instinctual agenda and he has he has the he has the uh, social instinct, the emotional, material security instinct, and the sexual instinct. And basically, the I, the parasite is running those drives. The parasite is running those drives. Like when I did a fourth step, the sexual inventory, it was incredible how I realized all my acting out sexually was really based on wanting to uh, to acquire self esteem. I had no idea that these things were all mixed up, but it was all premised on what was running the show, which was the disease of alcoholism or selfing to me. So we put the first column, Wendy, the second column, she left me. And then I look at those instincts and how Wendy's action affected them and, and which is causing the resentment towards Wendy. So I look at my social instincts. And I had an idea, I was like a ladies man, and now Wendy, leave, Wendy leaving me for another guy sort of affects that reputation. It affects my relationships with Wendy. It probably affects my relationships with women. It affects my relationships with uh, Wendy's family. So it has a big, and it affects my self-esteem and my, my, uh, my, the idea of myself. So all right, I go there. Then I go to the material security. Wendy's rich and I'm not. So I'm a little, I, I resent her for leaving because now I've got to start give, driving the Pinto again and forget about the BMW. So I started, so that's affecting my material security. My, and she has a beautiful house. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm kicked out of that house. My emotional security is sort of based on my material security. So when I'm, when I'm, uh, when I'm, living in the fear of financial and material insecurity i'm not emotionally sound yeah all right and then i go to the the third column which is sex and i look at sex from a view a uh, point of view of now and the future and i go i'm gonna miss having sex with wendy i may never have sex with another person and i'm definitely not going to have sex with the maid anymore so I have those, so those, all those things are producing the, the oomph of the resentment. And then I take it, and supposedly around the second or third column, you stop and you look at the people you're writing about, and you look at them with a view of perhaps they're sick, just as I am. And then I take it to the fourth column, and the fourth column just has a few questions for us to answer. And it says, where was I? And I like to say, where was I and am I? being selfish, where was I and am I being self-centered, self-seeking and frightened, where was I and am I inconsiderate and dishonest? And I just answer those simple questions. Bye, yeah. Now I've done a four column inventory. I took the person who I'm resenting, I looked at why I thought I resented her, I looked at how it affected my drives, my instincts, and then I looked at my, my uh, role in it, yes? I can do one, I can do 800. I can do thousands of it. So as soon as you get the formula of the resentment inventory, it's the same formula with the fear inventory and the sexual inventory, except the sexual inventory has a fifth column where you ask yourself, what could I have done instead after, the first, after you do the first four columns? So in this way, when I do the inventory, I start seeing the pattern of how self has defeated me. I see what self values and what it doesn't value. So I could see that 
I am very, even though I'm a drug addict and alcoholic, I have a huge, a huge sense of uh, pride or obsession with self. It's sort of like when I came in AA, they said, hey, you've got to be willing to save, it, save your ass instead of your face. But I thought at that time, my face was my ass. Yeah? I had an image and I went quite far to try to protect that image at all costs. All of these, all the distribution of behavioral patterns is rooted in the self running the show. And whatever the self deems important, its manifestations appear in. So if it's really important for you to have a lot of money, then you're probably going to have resentments and a lot of anxiety concerning money. Yeah, because and so all the information will show a pattern and that pattern will show a pattern of how we have been defeated. Yeah, that's how I see it. So that's the first one, resentment. Now, the fear one is can be different because you write down what you're afraid of and you may not have any reason for the fear in the second column because it's not coming from the outside. You think it is. You think the outside is provoking the fear, but it's the inside that provokes the fear. Yeah, that finds like ignition with an outside event. So the first thing is, all right, I'm afraid of whatever. I'm afraid of being destitute. Okay, why? Well, I think it's gonna mean no one's gonna love me, I'm bad. I'm never going to get what I, I want to because I have nowhere to go. I have nowhere to live. So destitution is provoking a lot of fear. So I look at that third column. I answer, I look at, all right, where's the fear being generated from? Is it because of my social instinct? Yeah. I don't want to be looked at as a bum. Yeah. I just don't. Is it material security? Yeah. I don't have food, clothing, and shelter. Is it, is it sexual? Yeah, no one's going to fucking, you know, sleep with me in the refrigerator box in Sixth and Market, probably. So there's a lot of fear being provoked by the agenda. And then I go to the fourth column and I ask those questions again. And usually, you know, where am I? Where was I being self-seeking and frightened? And so basically, usually when I have the fear of destitution, I'm not in destitution. I'm not even aware, I'm not even having any gratitude for how it is. I'm being totally provoked by a, a possibility in the future. So I've done the four columns there. I ask those questions and then I see another pattern of how fear, which is a manifestation of self, has defeated me. Yeah? And I go to the third column, sex. I write down people who I have hurt through the... Uh, wanting to have sex and it's not just people I've had sex with it's like the husband of a woman I had sex with and the children it could be a lot of people that I affected in that pursuit so I write those I wrote those things down I write down what you know a bare account of the incident or why I go to the third column and I see all right what the hell motivated me to act out basically my self-esteem my financial whatever and so it's sort of like doing an investigation but the investigation is not on us it's an investigation on self in my view yeah so that you can recognize the culprit by its manifestations instead of it instead of calling their ma the manifestations of self yours you'll see that they're not yours and a resentment and my resentment is usually different a resentment will come and go. My resentment may live for 40 freaking 50 years. I may build like a temple for it, yeah? So the importance in my view of seeing what's yours and what's not yours is incredibly, incredibly decisive with the, uh, with the serenity and the peace you're going to entertain. So, all right, so I do the sex, second column, the third column, I, I see what motivated me to act out, yeah, to, to uh, cause seemingly all this disruption. The fourth column, I ask the simple questions again. And then the fifth column is, I, because I wanna build a new ideal for my sexual and all my relationships, I say, what could I have done instead? So let's say I went out with another guy's wife and I, what could I have done instead? I could have called my sponsor before. 
yes, whatever. It's just those type of examples. And then when you have a new ideal of how you would like to be in regards to relationships, you ask, you ask that power, the higher power, to assist you in, in manifesting that. So to me, that's a, a very thick, a thick little, a very quick little thumbnail take on the third and fourth step. I'm just sharing my focal point, which is the recognition of what has defeated us through the inventory of its manifestation. Yeah. And to see maybe there's a distinction between that self, that disease, and us. And therefore to recognize that the manifestation, the manifestations may be coming through me, but they're not of me. Because if I recover from that disease of alcoholism, I'm going to be relieved a lot of the, from a lot of the manifestations of self. Definitely. Definitely. That's the progression of recovery. There's a relief because when you're obsessed with that, when that thing has taken over you, let's say the pH of the body is sort of acidic and all that shit grows in it. Vindictiveness, resentment, fucking anxiety. It has a, it's a very healthy Petri dish to grow all that shit. What recovery has done with me is change the pH of Paul. Heaven. <laughs> it's changed the pH where I, I am not hospitable to the disease of alcoholism anymore. I'm not one of its sought out environments. And I am, and basically you can, in that sense, you have an immunity and the immunity is expressed as the experience of the problem doesn't exist for you that day. And if you want to call your spirit's condition, the pH balance, go ahead. But I humbly believe we are a spiritual condition. Therefore, that pH balance is set. It's stabilized. As long as there's not that obsession and that getting sucked up into the mental state where self abides, the problem resides in the mind, I feel there's the, the progress of recovery will lead you to many, 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 many days of the problem doesn't exist for us anymore. So there you go. Wow. Great. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you have it. <laughs> That's great. Okay. So, um, so apologies for the uh, little, little trolls there. We, I think we've uh, kicked them all out. So now it's um, over to you. So if you want to ask uh, Paul a question, um, can you do, if you're familiar with it, um, use the hand icon, raise the hand icon um, in the chat box thing, or, um, or you can raise your hand and I'll scan. So, does anyone uh, just want to digest that for a minute and you want to raise your hand? Let me know. Okay, yeah, we've got, um, okay, so Mike, I'm unmuting you. There you go, man. Okay, thanks. Hi, guys. Um, I, I love, Paul, knowing about how you had your eight weeks of coming to believe as opposed to I was pretty much put through um, doing it really quickly, which now I take as kind of being in contrast to the only low bottom drunks at the beginning of AA, um, as opposed to appreciating the, the time to allow whatever it seems to take for you. And then with the higher power then, the importance of that, that if you, like you said, if it's linear, the, taking the time, um, what, what, how would you, um, Rip on uh, feeling comfortable knowing when it's right uh, to to tack to tackle whether you're gonna be in the right place to to make the decision to make a decision. Well, you know, my experience and my hope is that the sponsor isn't the sponsor the sponsor is a conduit for that grace or that power so he doesn't have to have an extreme knowledge of the steps but he has that grace coming through and you're probably going to get the right direction yeah that's how i feel so for me the observation didn't take long and a lot of people have different takes on the second step 
I just always got caught in the word came because came is a, a is a past event. So you already have a, you have already have arrived there by observing something. The effects of the program. Maybe it would take one day. Maybe it takes a few weeks. For me, it built up where I had a couple of months, and I hadn't ever had a couple of months since I was quite young, and. It was obvious something was doing for me what I couldn't do for myself because I was very clear that no human power could do it because my mother couldn't, you know, I couldn't, people who loved me couldn't, my uh, the state couldn't, no, nothing could to make me comply to sobriety. Yet something struck me sober. So, uh, yeah. So I don't know. I think it has a lot to do with the if you meet you meet a person, and uh, yeah, I'm not a very uh, big book thumper. I tend to just the relief is like the touchstones to my growth. I get there's relief occurs, and then there's reverse engineering why there didn't seem to be the relief. And I take my cues from there. And when I work with people, I take my cues from there. Yeah. So without you being, if, if you're not believing with certainty, I don't think it's a good time to move on from that step. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, next is Rod. Over to you, mate. Hey, thank you. Um, thanks a lot. Um, hi, Paul. So hey, Rod. Hey man, uh, so um, I was here the other day, Tuesday, and, and uh, this is a great concept about uh, getting past self and all, all, all our self-centeredness. And so what I wanted to ask you about was how, how can I absolve, how can I just ingrain humility in, into my, into my, into me, you know, into my steps and, and my daily walk in my life uh, so that I can get away from self, you know, the, the, the self-destructive, my, my behaviors and my attitudes, even after this little bit of time of sobriety. And, um, and, I, and I love this side of me as opposed to, you know, using and being what I was before uh, as an active alcoholic and drug addict. Uh, I mean, and I'm aware of Dr. Bob's, um, uh, humility plaque, you know, so I read it and a lot of times I'm, I'm still pretty self-centered, <laughs> you know, and that's just, I guess I have to be more proactive in, 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 in doing it, but I just wanted to take, get your, your take on uh, humility and uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, self not self-centeredness doesn't exclude you from humility. Yeah. There's humility in recognizing you're defeated. Yeah. There's humility in recognizing that there's something that has power over you. I don't feel there's a way to acquire humility. I think uh, you can open up a vicinity to it, which is, I would say, service. Yes. Service and just reflecting on what's happening with you. And seeing that uh, you had nothing to do with it, literally. Yeah, that's something, like we say, you'll suddenly realize that something is doing for you what you can't do for yourself. To me, that is that investigation of that and observation of that is, is, leads to humility. Yeah. And for me, humility, uh, the person who's in humility doesn't know they're in humility. Yeah because th there's been a loss of interest in self <laughs> at that moment and that's humility really yeah the self thing the self centeredness is claiming to be the one who's humble in a way yeah usually after the fact <laughs> so at the humility it's a is a consequence of living our lifestyle and just reflecting on the obvious uh we're overmatched you know <laughs> I mean, that should bring about a certain sense of right-sizedness, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really, literally. 
I mean, we're overmatched. That's, uh, for me, I got sort of struck sober and then quickly it was clear and then quickly it was clear that I believe with certainty without knowing how to live that life, but I believe with certainty that I was screwed and I wasn't managerial quality. <laughs> it was just very clear. So maybe that was an enforced humility on me. I don't know. <laughs> because, but something put a kibosh on the disease. Yeah. At least it's activeness at that time. And now it's been sort of muted for 30 something years. So. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. So I don't know. I, I th just don't believe that self centeredness can can arise it's that's a, that's the uh self-centeredness is the gps we live by yeah we're living in a self-centered system the the brain and the interprets life from a, a a position of self so it sees everything as how it pertains to it as a singular object yeah and so what yeah that doesn't have to be the dominant influence it doesn't, yeah. As is the dominant influence, you know. Spirit is spirit is the dominant influence, yeah. Like self-centeredness is like a flash in the pan. It can it blows up and it can maybe huff and puff for eighty years and then you pass away. <laughs> but this, but spirit or whatever is also it's always available at all times if you want to get into conceptual idea, no beginning, no end. I mean, I don't see, I don't see how you can believe you're far from that. It's looking right out of us, yeah? So those are, yeah, don't worry. Humility is part of the package of recovery. If you stick with it, yeah. <laughs> you're gonna see more and more that something's doing for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. Yeah, it's, it doesn't get less and less. You see more and more of it. Yeah. So, and there's no way you could, your mental arm can reach behind it and claim it. It's so obvious that, you know, something's really doing for us that we couldn't do for ourselves. It's just obvious, eh? Yeah. All right. And it takes a little bit of humility in a sense to come into AA in a lot of ways to, you know, like it says in the 12 and 12 about the first step, no one likes to admit that they've been, they're defeated, you know, but yeah. So there's a little humility right there. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks very much for that. So if you can mute yourself and now it's Luke from Birmingham. Uh, Paul, yeah, thank you. Thanks for uh, these these talks. It's been absolutely brilliant. I've had uh, a lot of great conversations that have come off the back of these discussions um, with, with guys that I work with and, and kind of sponsorship family. Uh, it's really interesting the way you described on Tuesday the uh, the kind of parasitical nature of uh, alcoholism and how that kind of uh, manifests in this this kind of uh, fertile ground. I actually read a, a paper recently on um, addiction from a kind of post-human point of view that called it an algorithm, uh, a kind of maladaptive alg algorithm, and that, and that kind of uh, reminded me of that. My question is on um, something that I've kind of intuitively noticed when um, in, in kind of home group settings and stuff where the, um, the self kind of masquerading as, as the higher power um, so it's kind of almost like, um, to use a more kind of psychodynamic phrase, you know, the, the, the ego reconstituting as the, as the higher power, it, it's kind of elusively uh, found its way back to the top table. Uh, I was just wondering if you could uh, speak on that, please, Paul. Yes. Um, well, first off, and again, this is just coming from me. I don't, the ego to me isn't what I call self. Self is the sense of having an ego or losing an ego. That sense of the one who has one or loses one, that's what I'm looking at. The ego to me is just a mental objectification by self, really. <laughs> really. So 
it's sort of like Dracula will go on vampire hunts to, to cause no one to figure out that he's the big vampire. Yeah. So uh, the idea of self is the sense of ownership. So when there's thoughts noticed, there's the feeling that I'm the thinker. That's self to me. Yeah. So most people are living life based on the assumption they're the thinker of all the thoughts. Yeah. So they, so there's a my that's put before the thoughts and now the thoughts can own you. Yes. So the same thing with feelings every day, there's tons of feelings go through this apparatus, but the mental state claims those feelings to imply the one feeler. That's the sense of self to me. Yeah. That's the bondage. So thousands of thoughts, one thought that I'm the thinker causes all those thoughts to have a lot of power. Yes? Because it's a lot easier to get out of a thought than your thought, I'll tell you the truth. And it's a lot easier to let go of a resentment than to let go of your resentment. <laughs> totally. So there's a role there that you can't see, but has a lot of influence. It's represented in English with the word my. It's represented in a lot of ways. To me, that's the selfing. That's where the disease thrives, yeah? Yeah, so uh, like when we go to AA meetings, this happens so many times. I came in there feeling very terminally unique, yes? Like a thick shell of uniqueness. I didn't, I truly believe no one thought like I did. No one felt like I did. No one had done the heinous things I had done. And after about three months of listening to people share their thoughts, their feelings, and their behaviors, I could only come to two conclusions. How did these people get my thoughts or they're not my thoughts? Yes? And that was a big, big, big day for me because I, had, I suddenly had space between whatever I am and thoughts. <laughs> the orbit was moved out and I could have some breathing room. And I first called them alcoholic thoughts because they were easier to recognize, but all of the thoughts are not of me, yeah? So that to me is the feeling of self. And of course, the selfing will claim whatever arises, yeah? So if the spiritual condition is there, the selfing will say, I'm the one who's having a spiritual condition. But after a while, you'll recognize it because it's tinny. It doesn't have, there's a certain feel to it, yeah? And if, if people have, you ever hear of an epiphany? Yeah, so people have these intervent, like an interruption in linear story. They get whacked and they feel the absence of self, basically. And what happens is the selfing returns by the thoughts, hey, I'm having this epiphany. And it's, so, it's really funny, the epiphany ends as soon as there's an acclaiming of the epiphany. <laughs> that's the selfie so you'll get used to it it says in AA you know all oh, this idea of a higher power you'll make mistakes around it you'll start thinking while you the selfing is masquerading is doing all this but you're going to mature out of it more gets revealed yeah the spirit is going to override because it's a it, the parasite has a huge dilemma it's been interest, introduced to a power greater than it, yeah? <laughs> it's like, so it's, and it, it's sort of like the, the little dog that was masquerading as the only big dog now has been introduced to a bigger dog, yeah? It starts rolling over, I'm serious. <laughs> I'm serious, it just, it's outmatched. The parasite is outmatched with the, reliability and the stability of spirit yes spirit ain't coming and going spirit's here for the long haul spirit is before you're screwed during you're screwed after you're screwed it's spirit it's always available at all times and when you start relying on it it will reveal and then as jesus says hey you'll know the tree by its fruits so you'll see you'll know selfing by its manifestations why not look at it that way Man, resentment, fears, harming other people, fucking obsession with the thoughts, those are all manifestations of self. They're not yours. Yeah. You're not going to get well as the disease. You're going to get well from the disease. Yes? 
you're not going to get well as a self. You're going to get well from self. That's why it says, please relieve us of the bondage of self. It doesn't say, please relieve us of self, because there really isn't any. There's the bondage of self. We're captured by an idea that's reinforced and assumed all day. The mental state is constantly producing selfing, which implies there's a someone. That's what happens. If you're addicted to thoughts, you're going to be addicted to self. The diagnosis is obvious. If you've been under alcoholism and then you get relief from it, you know, you get a good view of what alcoholism is and also what alcoholism isn't. And alcoholism isn't us. Yeah? It's a foreign pathogen. I am not, alcoholism has me. I don't have alcoholism. <laughs> you, better, you better look at the power structure. You don't have alcoholism. Alcoholism has you. You're outmatched, yeah? But we talk as if I have something. I, it's bullshit. We're a, in alcoholism and in recovery, we're a position of powerlessness, which if this exertion of power is very frustrating, when there's an admittance of the powerlessness, that's the key, yeah? Now you have power. So yeah, you'll have the eyes to see it. It's, you know, the thing isn't that good, to tell you the truth. It's mechanical. The selfing isn't like the, the most, it's, it has a lot of gaps in its little story, you know? Yeah, it does. And there's a, you know, you'll see it. You'll see through it. You have the eyes to see. You're in a spiritual condition now. The mental condition is what blinds us. Yeah, the problem resides in the mental conditions. Yeah, when we're out of that, or when the interest and attention leaves the obsession with the mental conditions, you have new eyes. You see things that you didn't see before, and you see very clearly you've been fucked <laughs> by something that's not you. <laughs> yeah, let's say I just want to riff on this. I let's say the parasite. It's like a, na a parasite in nature, yeah? Now this parasite called alcoholism is a very hostile parasite to the host, isn't it? When the parasite of alcoholism takes over the host, it's a nasty ride for the host. So you would think the host, being the host, would see the parasite as other and kick it out, yeah? Fuck, if a big bug landed with like tons of teeth and it tried to bite me, I'd knock it off. After 50 times, I'd knock it off. So the strategy of the parasite has to be really good, and it is. It convinces the host that it's the host. And then it just feeds off of us, as us. It talks to us as us. <laughs> it's re remembered as us. It's basically taken over the self-centered system to claim the self is us, the parasite. So now you can't entertain being free from it. You're trying to be free as it. And how's it working? It's a low, slow drudgery just to be able to not flip out at the next picnic you go to. That's a huge win in the first months of AA. We're so fucked up the ass of self. I mean, just uh, we, didn't, we didn't get into a fist fight on our first date. Wow. And it's a big win. It is coming from where we are. But well, let's not stay at that level. Yeah, the possibilities are huge. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. I'm, I've All just right. been reminded, just been reminded asked to ask you about the Pooper Scooper story if, if it relates to what you're talking about. Oh, the Pooper Scooper story. Yes, the Pooper Scooper story. All right, so. It does relate to this, the thing of self and, as, and the manifestation of self. So the Poopa Scoopa story is a guy lives at a really nice house, has a beautiful lawn, beautiful yard, has a porch. He jumps every day out into the morning dew with no shoes on. He, has, he, has, he rents it out for weddings and he has lawn bowling and croquet matches there. It's a large part of his life. He likes to hang out there with hammocks. And so one day he jumps out 
off the porch with no shoes on, lands in some shit, yeah? So he has, what the hell? And he wipes his feet off, gets on the porch, has to start wearing shoes, puts on the shoes, starts walking around the property. There's a lot of shit all over the place. And so he's sort of frustrated because he has a freaking wedding that weekend. So he tries to clean it up and he goes back in for lunch. He goes out, there's more shit. So he finally just says, fuck this, goes inside and starts just forgetting about it. And it goes back out later and it stinks to high heaven. There's tons of different varieties of shit. They're everywhere. And so he's frustrated. He calls some friends and he hears the same story. A lot of people had beautiful lawns and now they can't use it because there's so much shit on it. So they start having meetings and they're trying to find, you know, what to do and da da da. And so this guy comes in and says, hey, if you get really good at scooping up the poop, yeah, and I've got a machine, if you get really good at it, maybe you'll have like a three by seven foot piece of lawn for a couple hours with no shit. Fucking, that's the best I can go for. All right. So this guy starts picking up poop -a -scoop with a poop -a scoop and he gets two at the same time and he gets pretty good at it. And it starts, the community starts hearing about it and they, he's asked to speak. He becomes a circuit speaker and he's going around singing the glories of pooper scooping and blah, 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 super fast. And he starts a business. He's got like pooper scoopers in his garage. He's got a tutorial. He's selling them autograph models, has a little leather jacket, senior pooper scooper, whatever. And he's on circuit. He's talking at big events. And he's got his whole life now is based on being able to pick up shit really efficiently. Yeah. So now he thinks he has a solution. So one day a guy walks in and says, hey, I hear you have a lot of trouble with shit. Oh, no, no. I'm like the master pooper scooper. I pick it up so fucking fast. And the guy goes, OK, starts walking out. He says, why don't you just find the dog? And the guy gets and you would think the guy would go right for it. There's the solution. Take away the source, there won't be the effect. Get rid of the dog, there won't be shit. Yeah, but now, you see, the pooper scooper guy is identified as being the pooper scooper guy, yeah? He sort of, his whole life is based on being the pooper scooper guy. So he's not rushing for the solution because he thinks he has a solution. He can pick up shit pretty damn fast. But the source of it, yeah? So in a way, because there's an identification as self, so we take ourselves to be the dog, we can't take, we can't really entertain getting rid of the dog, yeah? So therefore, we become masters of picking up shit, which is fine and dandy, but I'd rather just get rid of the dog. <laughs> I would. <laughs> so that's, it was a point I used to use trying to get something across. It's all about communicating. You're attempting to communicate ideas that trigger a little avalanche in the person, yes? So the pooper scooper was to see that over time, we're quite, the mental state is addicted to being a self, mm -hmm. yeah? Why do you think we drank so fucking much? We were trying to get out of self, unknowing to us as self. <laughs> That's why addictions never work, because they can't target the real target. Because it will be me, the me I want to get out of that's doing the coke, yeah? I did tons of coke. I never reached a point where I just thanked the goddess of coke and just, oh, I'm totally satiated now. I'm going to give all my remnants of coke to others. Thank you, Lord Cocaina, or whatever. I'm chilled. I'm freed. No, because the addiction isn't hitting the target. The real addiction is the mental addiction to self into being the thinker and the feeler and the haver and the loser, yeah? That's the addiction. And then alcoholism fixes to that addiction and just amplifies it, yeah? So if you have a little bit of jealousy and then you start drinking and using, you're up on stalking charges in a few months, yeah? It amplifies. If you were somewhat angry, you're really fucking angry, yeah? But if you, if you want to separate the alcoholism from the self, you haven't got to the cause of the disease. <laughs> the cause of the disease is what's, what's allowing alcoholism to, to demonstrate and express itself. The addiction of self, yeah?
of the addiction of being a thing at the expense of the knowledge of being spirit. Yes. Because while you're actively identified as self, you're in an active denial of your real nature, basically. This is just a take. I entertained it or it entertained me and it's produced a traveling lighter for many, many years in sobriety. And I can't argue with the results, tell you the truth. And uh, if people had something that was really cool and it lasted, I'd probably be interested in it, but I don't see much of it. So this is <laughs> just, there's so many things, this idea, the mental state tells us we can be out of a moment. It does, doesn't it? I've been totally out of it. I'm totally out of it. But if you look at the surveillance cameras, you were there, yeah? So it, it, it's, it gives itself a power it doesn't have to get you out of the moment. And then you decide to try to change that by getting into the moment. I'm telling you, you can't be out of a moment. It's impossible. There's no moment without you. None, none. So this insanity of trying to get into what we can't be out, which is the moment, and then trying to get out of what we can't be in, which is self, is truly the basis of a bizarro world, in my view, like the comic book, the Superman comic book. Everything is the opposite. It's mm -hmm. incredibly insane. We're taking ourselves to be a physical, mental condition, trying to acquire a spiritual condition, all the while being a spiritual condition, with an affliction of a mental physical condition. Yeah, yeah. And spirit has no malady. This is not a spiritual malady. There's no malady in spirit. It's a mental malady. The spirit is fine. Nothing's ever happened to it. <laughs> you don't get a new spirit. You know, the spirit doesn't recover. It just is always available at all times, right where we are, exactly like at every freaking damn moment of our life. So okay. that's that. <laughs> right. Okay, thanks very much. If you could mute yourself there, Luke, that was great, mate. Um, so David C, mate, I'm going to unmute you now. Appreciate it. Well, um, so I've seen this uh, shit a lot in my own experience. Would you talk a little bit about how uh, like working a four step to get free as self is di different than working to get free from self? Well, the, the, the biggest dilemma, if we're still under the illusion that the manifestations of selves are ours, yeah, that's going to inhibit the effect of the fourth and fifth step for sure. Yeah. So that's a primary that's a prime, see to me it says be, being convinced that self defeated us. I would like to have that carry through through the whole process. Yeah? I don't want it to be, I don't want it to be forgotten and then the, uh, the lazy assumption that their mind arise again because that's going to limit the effects of recovery, definitely. Just look at just take some three words that are important to you, like money, let's say, sex, health. Put those words there, just feel them, and then put the word my before it. My money, my health, my sex. It's changed the word that comes after it quite a lot, yes? I can say I want everyone in these squares right now to have a lot of money, but I don't want any of you to have my money, yes? Yeah? The my changes the idea of money. Well, the I, the my changes resentment. It gives life to resentment. Um, a resentment as claimed as yours can live for 40 fucking years. It can live for the rest of your life. Yeah? Because we're feeding it. We're its source. So the light to remember a resentment of 30 years ago doesn't come from the resentment. It comes from us. We're the light. Yeah? And it's the my, it's the my of the resentment. Through the my, we're giving light to the resentment. We're giving life to the resentment. It's on, we're giving it mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Resentments are just like everything else. They come and go. 
Why are there this ones that stay for 60 years? Because they're living off of us. Yeah? We're freely, unknowingly giving them light by calling them mine. Yeah? My fear. Jesus. And mostly it's not even fear. It's anxiety. It's mental anxiety. And I'm telling you, mental anxiety is the demonstration of faith and thought. That's what mental anxiety is. Mental anxiety is faith in thought. If there's faith in thought, you're going to be anxious about the future, and you're going to be anxious about what you thought the past was. It's just that freaking simple, because the thoughts are usually about that. Yeah. The thoughts aren't. It's our faith in them. Yeah. Perhaps there's a better way, trusting something infinite rather than finite self. What does it look like to trust something that's finite? A belief and a faith in it. We've, been, we've had faith in a failed system. And we're now entering, there's a, a humble admittance of that, I hope. And now we, knowing it or not, we're, being, we're submitting ourselves to be changed by this way of life and move from trusting something finite to trusting something infinite. And how that looks is you lose interest in thoughts. Yeah, you lose interest in mind. You're not, the, the mental state isn't like using a resentment of 30 years ago, like the golden calf, milking it all fucking day. Yeah, that's over. Yeah. And then when a resentment shows up, you write about it. You, after a while, you don't even have to write about it. You do it in your head. You call up your sponsor or some person that you trust. Tell them, hey, I felt a little queasy here, so I figured I should share this with you. There you go. Yeah. I swear, what, what you claim to be yours is going to stick around. <laughs> Fucking stick around. So there's, a, there's a hand up. Okay. So I just want to go down, because Sonia's had a hand up for a while, and then she keeps going off. Sonia, All I'm right, going to go straight Sonia to you. Then Terry. Yeah. Sorry? Oh, Terry. I've got hey. Sonia. No, Sonia's got a hand up in the thing. So Sonia, it's over to you. Okay, again, thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Um, brilliant. Um, so it was very, um, my epiphany began when someone introduced to me the set aside prayer. And, you know, all these steps are in an order for a reason. You know, I always hear that, but I really had to set aside everything that I thought I knew to have a new experience because the me, the who I brought to the rooms and uh, to the sponsor and uh, to everything was um, just uh, appeared to be not working and broken and um, defiant and arrogant and just full of self, full of bondage of self. But I was introduced to that prayer and that set aside prayer and I did it like my life depended on it. And it was the beginning, it was the beginning that um, to experience what it feels like to lay all that shit aside that I thought was true and then to move into, um, because I mean, I had enough knowledge to know it, the, the, allergy of the body was in the mental obsession but there was still that anguish which resulted from my thinking it centered in my mind and so the only way i got relief was either to run from it or somehow do this thing that everybody said would work and so i had to kind of trust that and um when I got to step two, then I had a big problem because I was so prejudiced. So I had to set all that aside for a new experience. And um, an exercise that was given to me was, why don't you walk around for a few days just accepting that God is everything and then report back and then 
the second instruction after a few days of that was, okay, now go in your life like God is nothing and do that for a few days and report back. And it was clear to me that it felt a hell of a lot better, that it felt easier, simple, lighter. You talk about traveling lighter. When God is everything, I travel light. And, um, and then it says, you know, when you've made that sorry, decision. Excuse me, Sonia, Sonia, is there, can you, we, we're sort of limited time. So if you've got a question, oh, I'm sorry. ask it, please. Thank you very much. Sorry, sure. with respect. Oh, okay. So the question is, is um, when, so it tells us to dive right away into the fourth step. And um, it's really that fourth column where things change. And I just wanted to, for I just wanted to ask you if you could talk about the selfishness of seeking dishonest part. I know you've talked about fear, but how that manifests itself still. Well, that's because it stems from the self-centered system we're relying on. Yeah. It's not a centered system. It's a system centered on self. So self, the way self sees things, the way self is produces manifestations and effects those effects run rampant through us when we're in a disease of alcoholism that is an extreme version of self-centeredness and so the manifestations of selfishness self-seeking and frightened and i always loved the way they used they didn't say self-seeking and then and frightened because self-seeking and frightened go together Usually the self-seeking, its base is fear that is probably not going to work out. So this idea of self-seeking and frightened and selfishness and then inconsiderate and dishonesty to me are just certain uh, examples of the two prior ones, selfishness and self-centeredness and self-seeking and frightened. So uh, for me, those manifestations are going to continue and the force of them are going to be weighed by how much there is an identification as self in place. So an identification as self can extend resentments and fears and harming others and by acting out a lot to very, for long fucking periods. You have to cut it to me off at the distribution point, which is self. So when I saw it wasn't me, I started losing interest, which is its fuel. I started losing interest in that. Like it says in AA, you'll lose interest in self and gain interest in others. That's exactly the process we're in. Yeah. And when you lose interest in self, you'll lose the, the, then the selfishness and the self-centeredness will weaken. So their effects will weaken because you've removed the light that was giving them the juice. Yes. That to me is recovery. So. But to get to the exact nature of the wrong and the, and the, the causes and conditions, I feel uh, the causes and conditions goes to the original addiction to self. Yeah. Yeah. So there you have it. That's just the diagnosis, I feel. I hope that <laughs> helped, but not. So if you want to sort of, if you, if you want to get out of self-seeking and frightened, then realize you're not in self. <laughs> that's that will be the way to get out of it. If you set off to get out of self-seeking and frightened, that's self-seeking and frightened, really. <laughs> so yeah, there's a little bit of a Chinese thumb torture that we get caught in because self can't get out of self. Yeah. So that's what she, someone was sharing about it earlier about when self claims to be the higher power. That's sort of what we're saying there. The self is playing the it's playing the higher power concerning uh, in the situation. So self can't get out of self. So where's the way to get out is realizing you're not in, tell you the truth. Yeah. How can you get out of an imaginary place? It's impossible. So the best way to get out of an imaginary place is to see that it's imaginary. The best way to get out of self is see that you're not a self. Yeah. And how do you do that? Well, you'll recognize it by its manifestations and then the manifestations lead or mirror the idea of self and maybe you'll get a hit 
and then the spiritual condition will be emphasized more than this, the mental condition. That's all. I would say it has a lot to do with grace, but it's grace abounds. Grace is there. It's available. Yeah. So, any more questions, Dave? Yeah, just two more, mate. Um, next, what, last, uh, second last one from uh, Daz, Paulus Daz, mate. Over to you. Hi, Paul. Grateful to be here. Grateful to be sober. Thank you so much for answering our other fellows' questions. You really cleared a lot of things up in my mind. Um, I'd just like to talk about my step um, step four and how I arrived at it. I arrived at it still full of um, bewilderment, fear, terror. And I thought I'd hit the ground running and I'd got through step one as I'd surrendered and admitted and I'd come to believe and I'd handed over my thinking and my life. Um, so I thought it'd be quite easy to hit, to search and look for the resentments that I could put down on paper. Um, but I hit it with a feel, fearful um, attitude and feeling inside me. It wasn't a fearless moral inventory at, at the first time around. So I looked in the big book and a lot of, in there, the examples are Mrs. Brown and, and everybody else. So... I sort of like thought, I'll just copy bits of that out and, you know, I'll miss bits out and I missed the fundamental person out there. I missed out me. I didn't put me in my first round of resentments. And I read out my fourth and f uh, my fifth step and I felt shitty for about 18 months. Um, I knew that I'd not done it properly. So the second time came around again and I was on there at the top, about 10, 15, probably 20. I can't remember now. Um, so I started to look at myself in the f first, second time round. I'm now on the fourth time round um, because there's like sex arms I missed out of there and fears out of there. Um, I was just wondering, I know how long you've been sober, but when, was, when did you feel like you'd nailed your step four and got every last resentment out there and thought, all right, I'm walking with the spirit now. I can now, you know, be more helpful to others than that because I've not met anybody yet that have said to me, I nailed it first time. Well, I don't think anyone nails it, but uh, the, second, the second one I did, I had the understanding of my role in things, which changed the uh, the data that was in the first one, but the understanding wasn't in the first one. The second one was written from the understanding of my role in things. So really in importance, the fourth column would be the first column, really. But we arrive at the fourth column, but really it's the first column, This, you know, where was I or am I selfish, self-seeking and frightened? And then the shit comes from there. But basically the way we look at it is from a self-centered view. So, oh yeah. And then we have to arrive there at the fourth. Hopefully down the road it switches and you see that before all the incidents. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because the incidents are like uh, an expression of self-seeking and frightened and selfishness, self-centeredness. So if you can start seeing that first, then you don't have as many incidents anymore. <laughs> in other words, the resentments haven't got out in the mass population. You caught them sort of in the crib, you know. <laughs> and I, I hope if you stick with the program of AA, you'll outgrow fear and resentments and stuff because the Petri dish will change and that shit won't be growing as fertile in you anymore. You won't be a, a, like a, an acidic little pH bowl for that shit to grow. And so you won't have to go through these columns as much because you won't have anxiety. You won't have fear. There'll be anxiety, but it won't be your anxiety. Yeah. And so, yeah. It takes what it takes, but the fourth step is very important with the fifth step, which we'll get to next Tuesday as an advertisement to come back. <laughs> I don't want to jump the gun now, but yeah. And remember, it doesn't have to be perfect, 
it's really the willingness being demonstrated by doing it. The willingness is really the clay that the higher power can sculpt, yes? The willingness. That to me is the real, this idea of going to any lengths. What happens to me now on those levels is people call me one in the morning and they tell me, oh, they got this guy, they wanna can drive him somewhere, can you help us? So I go, all right, I start putting my pants on. They call me back, oh, don't worry, we took care of it. So I got all the cred, all the credibility because I was willing, but I didn't have to go to any lengths. So that's usually the case now. <laughs> so the willingness is the key all the way through, yeah? You don't have to do it perfect. Yeah, yeah no, you just have to, for me, to see the patterns, because the patterns that are, are seen in the fourth and the fifth step is what is the material that gets reconfigured through step six and seven, because they will keep appearing but you can catch them before they get out of the oven, you know? You can recognize them and go, hey, I'm entirely ready. And I like to use the word reconfigure because I don't think you can, uh, energy can't be created nor destroyed, but it can be reconfigured. So I always go, I'm entirely ready to have this reconfigured and I ask that power to do it, yeah? So six and seven is, is available only because course the patterns of defeat were illuminated in four and five so the fourth and fifth steps uh, step bring illumination to some unknown patterning that was of influence your life greatly but you were unconscious of they become you become conscious of them and then six and seven is not that you do anything about them when they're recognized you ask that power to reconfigure them that's the spirit of aa it's not a self-help program, nor does it turn into one. It's a, it's a reliance on a higher power program. Yeah? So four and five are very important. It's, quite, it's sort of like uh, the manifestations of self get highlighted, like in yellow. And when they appear in your life, which they will, you can recognize them. Instead of recognizing them after the fact, which is a lot of mess, yeah? I'd much rather see it before than after. And, and the quicker you can get them out of the oven and bring them to six and seven, I find there's a lot of juice in meetings to do that. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. You're fine, brother. I'm giving, I'm giving you a, a healthy, healthy diagnosis. Just, just stay on the operating table. Don't get up, don't play doctor. It's, gonna, it's going great, really, literally. Could you imagine if all these squares were unleashed to the world they're in, drunk and fucking on drugs? These squares would be like full of sirens and fucking hospital beds and fucking courtrooms and fucking alimony payments and stalking charges and fucking shit like that. People pissing in their pants. We got the luxury to talk about the problem because we're not living under the fucking problem. Yeah. People who are living under the problem, they're not, not talking about the problem. We're the problem to them. The world's the problem to them. They don't see their role in it, and therefore they're fucked by it. And then they gather together to be right about it. Yeah? They don't want to come into AA. Yeah. And then, unfortunately, they go to one meeting, don't even stay there the whole time. They leave, and now they think the rest of life, they know what AA is. Mm -hmm. And so when they're desperate to have it oh i know that that's not going to work they went for 15 minutes they have no idea of the recovery program it's insane it's totally insane this mental state has us by the gonads yeah. it's it's crippling us with an interpretation of life and it's causing us not to be conscious of the living of life yeah our greatest hope is I will be okay. Not that I am okay, but I maybe I will be okay later. What an insane fucking booby prize. It's slavery to me. Seriously, it's slavery. Yeah. And it's not just the drinking and the drugs. The disease goes on after the drinking and drugs stop. Yeah. 
because the original disease isn't about drinking and drugs. It's about obsession with self. And you can see it. If you want to see the obsession with self, it's having faith in the thought system. That's it. If you're believing the thoughts about yesterday and tomorrow, tomorrow can ruin your day today. It can. Can tomorrow do that? No, but the faith that, that you are in it can. That's, that's incredibly mind-boggling to me. Yeah. Read page. Do, we, do you mind if you have a minute or two? I was just going to say, Paul, we've got a couple more questions as well. So are you okay to keep going? I'm just I'm mindful of your yeah, time yeah, as well, mate. Yeah, I, I just want to get this one point across. Yeah, sure, mate. No, just fine. As long as you can keep going, that's great. Uh, in We Agnostics, on page 53, at the bottom of it, yeah? This is Bill W. and whoever is writing it. Page, if you have the book, page 53, the bottom. He's trying to make it as easy as possible for agnostics to sort of enter the AA program. But he goes here, that was natural, but let us think a little more closely. Without knowing it, had we not been brought to where we stood by a certain kind of faith, yeah? without knowing it, without knowing it, we're unaware of it, but something has brought us somewhere, which is the faith. The faith in the disease has brought us to a condition without us knowing it. Yeah? Without knowing it, had we not been brought to where we stood by a certain kind of faith, for did we not believe in our own reasoning? Did we not believe in our own reasoning? Did we not have confidence in our ability to think? What was that but a sort of faith? Yes, we had been faithful, abjectly faithful to the God of reason. That means like totally faithful to the God of reason. The problem resides in the mind, and its fuel and its life is faith. It's living off of us as faith. So in one way or another, we discovered that faith had been involved all the time. All the time. Not just back then. All the time. Faith is involved all the time. Our condition right now is about faith. If you change that thing, perhaps there's a better way and change the word trust to faith. It could be said just that way. Perhaps there's a better way having faith in something infinite rather faith in something finite. Yeah? In finite self. That's the program. Moving the faith from a failed system to a working system. And most of the shit's happening without us knowing it. Seriously. So, all right, thanks. I just wanted to share that. We agnostic, page 53, top of 54. Okay. All right. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so, Kerry Klein, mate, you want to ask a question? It's over to you. You're unmuted. All right. Hey, Paul, so you can hear me. Hey, um, I'm up in Minneapolis. I'm going to just uh, try to be as succinct as I can. Had too much time to think here, and uh, my mind is uh, going a little bit, but... Um, number one, uh, I want to say that uh, I'm very grateful. Uh, I've been following you for a long time, and I was at a meeting one time, and I had mentioned, I ended my little share with what you're looking for is what's looking, and then uh, this guy came up to me and said, hey, do you know Paul Hitterman? And uh, it turned out to be somebody you know, and he called you, and anyways, my question is this. My Christian. question is this. Um, a higher power, I mean, I'm just, I mean, if you can share your, if it's possible to share your concept of a higher power, and the part that always gets me is like, when you start talking, like, quit playing God, and if the part, you know, the part of me that's playing God hears that, you know, it goes on, 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 so what, how, how do you, what is your concept of, of God, if you can put it into words or, or not? All right, so that's, I like to talk about the quit playing God thing. I forgot to present that. To me, that's the, 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 the unspoken step of AA, is quit playing God. And he says why, it doesn't work. Now, my humble diagnosis is the mental state is playing God. Yeah, 
the thought system wakes you up to thoughts about how the day is going to be before you even get up, how you are, how they're going to be. You're going to be fired. It's pontificating and forecasting. It's playing God all day. Now, unbeknownst to us in most cases. So when that which is playing God, here's the, the statement, you have to quit playing God. What happens? So that which is playing God tries to quit playing God. That's fucking playing God ad infinitum. Yes? There's, I rest my case right there. I'm saying that mental state is playing God and it's reading the book of recovery from it. Yeah? And it runs into the statement you have to quit playing God, and that which is playing God, if it tries to quit playing God, that's playing God. It can't get out of it, yes? That's the thing of self can't get out of self. And so a concept that I've used in AA when I share is that the higher power is always available at all times, right where I am, with no requirement to meet it, yes? That's my, that's my sense of it. It's always available at all times, right where I am, with no requirement to meet it. If there are requirements, they're on my side. Okay. Yeah. So, all right, you wanna go to, thanks bro, Karen, yeah. that's all right? Yeah, and then finally, Shirley, it's over to you. Last question of the I evening, of the day. <laughs> well, I just wanna say that, uh... You, my, you just blew my, you blew this little stupid fucking mind, which is just wonderful. I mean, I'm sober a long time and I, you know, I'm, I, I was a psychotherapist before I retired and years and years in psychotherapy and just listening today, and I'm sober 35 years, and just fucking listening today, I'm realizing how much self was getting rid of self. I mean, it was just like, I'm sitting here and I say, ah, shit, you know, this has been going on and going on and going on and still going on and still with that ma. So anyway, Paul, blessings. Thank you so much. That's well, I'm always happy to see you, Shirley. What, darling? Happy to see you, Shirley. You're happy to see you too. Yeah. Amazing. And, and everyone else. So, uh, yeah. Okay. That's it. Yeah. So just um, final words, just a, a bit of a plug, like Paul said, um, if you want to know some more about him and you've, this is the first time he has a website, um, zenbitslap.com and you'll find a lot of um, stuff. There's a lot of reading material. There's a lot of um, video and audio and it's amazing stuff. I stumbled upon Paul about a year ago on, on YouTube and I highly recommend you check out his other stuff as well because it's, it's quite phenomenal. That's my opinion. Um, don't forget, please spread the word. If you've enjoyed tonight, or today, sorry, this morning, um, then come back and bring your friends because I think this is really important stuff for me. I've got so much out of that. And I think the, uh, the, the people that have been here, I'm hoping that you did as well. So yeah, so that's it. So remember we, we got, we have it, uh, just to jump in. Yeah, sure. We have a Tuesday, Thursday at 1030. And then we have our own groups from where I live, uh, seven, it's gonna be seven o'clock Wednesday night, Pacific time. We're changing it. And then one thirty oh. Saturday, where there's oh, people recovery, but it's mostly based on a idea called non duality. So those have a different somewhat of a different flavor. And uh so that's Wednesday night, seven it's gonna be, and Saturday, one thirty, and then we're gonna keep doing this Tuesday, Thursday at ten thirty, and we'll probably keep doing it after we go through the steps. Maybe we'll do it on abstinence and surrender and other ideas in recovery. Yeah. yeah that's amazing. That's, that's fantastic. Um, yeah. Unless so, um, a better option. Unless I and get that, a better that option. 1.30 makes it easier for people, that, all the, yeah. the POMs that are here, all the English, you know, if you're abroad or Irish, wherever you are, this is um, a great opportunity to see him. Um, the, the, sat, oh, the, the non-duality stuff is, is phenomenal as well. It's amazing. So I would highly recommend it. So please spread the word about this. It's important. So, um, but with that, I'll just leave Paul. Any anything else you want to say, mate, before we kick off? I just want to thank everybody, and uh, I'm seeing everyone. I'm so happy. I see Asheville, my friend there. I see Rob, 
a lot of people. I appreciate it. I always go through everybody and thanks for uh, just spending time with us. And uh, yeah, I hope it's helpful. Let's put it that way. All right. Thank All you. Right. Thank you very much, everyone. Good night. Oh, good and day. David, and I'll see you, see, you, see you Tuesday.